all my incredible Hulk up there and then bend down to the uh, microphone and you'll see why in a moment. I think I need to bring a uh, full circle to this conference by s saying I am not a Lutheran theologian. <laughs> I am not a, even a Germanistic rhetorician <laughs> or a psychoanalyst. I'm no Jack Kennedy, <laughs> and I'm no Barack Obama. I can't dance or jump. So I'll sit down here for these couple of minutes that you've graciously given me. I want to propose a thesis that moves probably one step beyond where all of you are and argue that beyond toleration and understanding and appreciation and respect, this global world of a global Luther requires that we come together in these three faiths of Abraham because of the lethal distortions that have come into our three faiths by our alienations. So a couple of uh, paragraphs on that for your uh, discussion. The global Luther construes and constitutes the one God, the beloved God, whose judgment is love and whose love is judgment. This God manifests being as the beloved son for a beloved world and in beloved community. These three themes are respect, respectively developed in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, who constitute three quarters of the world's population. My short footnote on this interfaith panel argues that the provocative assertions of the historical Luther on Jews and Muslims need now to be transfigured in the global Luther to a reciprocity and synergy, a kind of uh, th received theosis where we see the destiny of the three faiths of Ab Abraham as that to point toward each other. As the one God of the Shema binds the covenant people of Israel and the high priestly prayer of Jesus, that they may be one, Father, as we are one, forms the church. As the Shahada of Allah is the gateway for the Holy Ummah, God's own redeemed world, or worlds as the case may be, is being fashioned within world history. This divine gift to the world condemns and confounds our propensity to anathematize each other and even eliminate the other. If the one God, in the one God, our babble and our dissociation from the other, is muted and transmuted into the one reality, which is the divine will for this free and rebellious world. In the light of my poor presbyopic eyes, only two futures are possible. Either fate, continued fateful trifurcation which will eventually destroy the world, or a faithful unification of Abraham's family. So tonight, as we take our leave from one another, and as our friends return to Africa, to Europe, to the Middle East, what is transpiring before us in Darfur, in the new Kosovo and in Palestine, Israel, bores, bears out, I think, this impending decision that we must make to come together or to witness the disintegration of God's world.
Luther loved Psalm 122, even though he misconstrued it. <laughs> Jerusalem was the church for Marty. And I think we can only, as modern Lutherans, say that we can only say Zion is the church if we are prepared to say the church is Zion. But you remember the words. I was glad when they said, we will go up to the house of the Lord. Here the tribes go up and give thanks to the name of the Lord. There are set the thrones of judgment, the thrones of David's house. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They that love you shall prosper. The two walls of Bethlehem and the Gaza are offense to the one God, an offense. I believe that Jerusalem symbolizes the connection of heaven and earth, of eternity and time. I've learned this from Martin Buber, for whom Zion can only be Zion, and in contact with the thou of the other and the eternal thou, if it is tri-faith. If I forget you, O Zion, if I forget you, O Golgotha, if I forget you, O Akedic Kaaba, let my right hand that has failed to be extended in justice and peace wither away. In the agonal cross of Luther, in time and eternity, of crusades along the Rhine and expulsions from, pain, from Spain, where Jews and Muslims are slain together by the Schwert of Christendom, to Armenia and Auschwitz, to Algeria and Abu Ghraib, where we slash with the Schwert of hate in the face of the beloved God. We even have the audacity to politicize John the Seer's terrible pacifying sword of the Spirit in the book of Revelation to a Christ on Clint Eastwood's white horse mowing down heathen and idolaters and apostates, a slashing sword from the messianic throat. If you don't believe our world understands that, watch with my wife who teaches film here at the university. Watch the Academy Awards tomorrow night. There will be blood. And a film she particularly wanted me to see. This is no country for old men. <laughs> the Judaic gift of the beloved son I take from John Levinson, who wrote that wonderful book here in our library. The Beloved World is a, t a text of John 3.16, well known to all of us, but most of us do not understand that it comes from Genesis chapter 22. And every time you ever see the word agapetos or monogenos, the beloved child or the only begotten child, that comes from the Abraham story. And the Holy Uma, I feel, is, is one of the most powerful divine pictures of the one world that the Shema and the high priestly prayer of Jesus is about. So I ask you tonight to affirm with me as we depart as friends and in the spirit of last night's musical, that we march forward with justice and peace to the victory of the slain lamb, singing the songs of Zion, where nations are healed as they stream up together to Jerusalem. 
And let us remember with the passion of our speaker this evening the words of the psalm. I will not forget thy law. I will not forget thy word. I will not forget thy commandments. For if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, if I fail to extend this hand of justice and peace, let that hand wither away. It has become useless. Thank you. <clears throat> so I want to thank all our speakers and panelists. <clears throat> it's customary in academic circles, it's, uh, it's customary protocol in academic uh, settings. For me at this point to ask Bishop Yunnan to, if he has any comments, I, I hope he will forgive me if I don't do that, um, but instead invite... Um, <laughs> invite comments from the audience. We, we don't have that much time left, and I know that Christine would very much want the, your voices to be the last voices heard, so before we march out in the, in the blood of the lamb to get some wine and <laughs> refreshments uh, in the back, uh, let me ask if there are questions or comments. Uh, yes, please, yep. Hello? Uh, yes, it's on uh, now. No. Um, I, I had a question for Professor Sommer. Um, I was curious as you were speaking about what, uh, what I perceived as a kind of uh, displacement. Um, you were talking about the student who wrote of his anti-Semitism uh, and he was working on it. And speaking of your racism and you're working on it. Uh, and speaking of the anti-Semitism of the liberal Protestants with whom you're in uh, dialogue and the thought and hope that they're working on it. What was missing from that relation was your attitude towards liberal Protestants. Uh, is there an anti-Protestantism uh, <laughs> that you're working on <laughs> or an anti-Christianism that you're working on? If there's an anti-Protestant um, attitude, I'd have to admit it only began to creep in after these discussions began. <laughs> um, I, I don't say that as a joke. I say that um, with, I say that deeply upset. Um, but I think that that probably is the case. Um, and if anything, I think that I'm more, uh, perhaps slightly more aware of how some of those attitudes come in, even within biblical scholarship. Um, so I, I, th I think that there is, um, and I'm not sure I'm yet working on it. I think I'm still somewhat stunned in this, in this late date to realize that that's there. Bishop Yunnan, would you like to join the conversation at this point? Yeah, I would like to join here. I think, you know, I would like to speak on... I would like you know to uh, to hear speak at least um, on Lutheranism. I cannot represent all the liberal or not non-liberal Protestants in the United States of America because I myself also have problems with many evangelical uh, uh, evangelicals in, in the United States of America or other parts. But I would like so to say that. And this I'd always <coughs> say to our Jewish friends, the Lutheran world okay. has been very serious <laughs> in repentance and they did not do yeah, it because they are late 40s until now, it's not only that we denounce, but we also live it. And we live it in the right way. And I think if we look at the work of the Lutheran World Federation, we don't only speak to the North, but when I spoke, I didn't have time to speak on a shift in Lutheran-Jewish relationship. We invited people from the South 
because we notice that there are some th there is something wrong. So I hope you know, uh, Professor uh, uh, Zomer can see that we are not doing that because we are anti-Semitic in ourselves and we want to show that we are not anti-Semitic, but we are doing that because this is healthy for our theology and for us, because what our father, Martin Luther, has done was not right. And we, we want really to, to say what is the right theology. It's at the same time, it sh should be also reciprocal for all of us religions. We cannot only, you know, we do it because we believe in it. But we also ask in love our uh, brothers in the Jewish community and sisters, of course, and our brothers and sisters in the Muslim community also to do what we Lutherans are doing. For example, are they ready to say that, yes, Christianity in the world is no more representing the Crusaders or colonialism. I think if we come to this point where what Professor Vox said that we want to have synergy for the healing, then we start the healing. But if we doubt that the other or suspect that the other is not serious or only denouncing because they are denouncing, then we are going to, to square number one, and we are not helping the healing. I believe in the Middle East, I have no luxury at all just to have, you know, uh, intellectual discussions. I have to live with the Jew and with the Muslim, and they have to live with us. There is no other option. I mean, and the only option is that the three of us will work for the healing, and not one will work and the other suspects. That's the only way we can go forward in our, uh, in our work. Secondly, I would like to comment on Professor, uh, Professor Omar. Sorry, I used in Arabic. Omar, uh, you see. Uh, 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 you see. Uh, and I would like to say it in this way. It is true. We believe as churches and as Lutherans and Protestants, I mean mainline Protestants, we believe Education is the answer to extremism. And it is not a new strategy in the Lutheran world or in the Protestant, or, or the Protestant world. A AUB, uh, the, the AUB, um, that means the American University in Beirut, the American University in Cairo, they were established 100 years ago by Protestant missionaries. And they have made the Middle East more tolerant. And I think, you know, we have really an education. Even we are asking as a Palestinian church, the Arab world, to change its curricula in how to read the Jews and how to read the Islam. And we ask them in their curricula also to change how to read Christianity. And I believe only education can help us in this synergy of healing. Are there questions, comments? From anywhere, yes. Um, thank you. I, uh, that was Bishop Yunan. Yeah, sorry, I was talking to you. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, a letter in response to a common word between us and you from the president of the Lutheran World Federation, uh, Bishop Hansen, where he said that uh, we all, as children uh, of God, are called to one another as to a holy site. The idea being that we, um, we signify who we are, but also the divine within us. And it reminds me that this isn't just a global, a global concern or perspective, but also national. I mean, I'm, I'm inspired by some of the comments you've, you've made about how we need to be able to be in dialogue with one another. How Rabbi Eric Yaffe met with the Islamic Society of North America and, and, and said that we as Jews, Christians, and Muslims need to stand together against stig stigmatization, such as Islamophobia, um, this term that gets used. And I guess 
all of that said, it seems like you and the, the, the religious leaders in Jerusalem and the municipal, municipality have a wonderful opportunity to suggest to others around the world, regionally or nationally, what would be the themes of concern, of dialogue or trilogue that would be most helpful to thinking about conflict in that region of the world first, and also to encourage them to think about the nature of conflict in their own regions. In the North American context, what do we and these three faiths have to learn from one another substantially that may be unique and may have ways of contributing uh, to reconciliation in other contexts? I guess I would just simply ask if you would take that as a request and see if, um, if those religious leaders would be willing to uh, present a paper or a statement or some sort of model that would say, this is really uh, what we would suggest you take on at the moment. Thank you. For me, um, I cannot speak on, uh, you know, a global interfaith dialogue. Uh, I can speak on contextual interfaith dialogue. Because you cannot generalize it. You, I don't want to dialogue on things that are for granted. I dialogue with those whom I disagree. I dialogue uh, with other religions in order to understand them and they understand me, not to convert them or they convert me. And for this reason, for example, in the Middle East, where we are wounded by hatred, by injustice, by occupation, by denial of the other, by insecurity, we find that justice is on our agenda, high on our agenda. And we are discussing that frankly and we don't hide our feelings, you see. And, um, and in addition to that, our relationship did not remain only on the table or intellectual. Also, it has really trespassed sitting on the table and dialoguing into becoming, you know, family friends. Sharing each other the Seder, Ramadan uh, table, sharing in our feasts, this really changes the whole atmosphere. It makes it, you know, the, an atmosphere of love. Not even if we disagree on these others, the, is, the Jew will not feel he is denied by me, and I will not feel that I am, I, I am chased by him or by her. This is the same thing that is very important, but I still say we are in the very beginning. We cannot brag that we have really achieved what we should achieve. We are still in the beginning. Now, when we go to Europe, to Europe the dialogue should be different at the moment. And I mentioned it in my paper, and I continue. It should be citizenship. And I think the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, I mean, was criticized I have the paper, I was prepared for this question. You see, I have all his paper with me. You see, he was criticized more than he deserves. His, he did not speak only on Sharia. He spoke also on the Jews in England. Can we continue to put them under the white? Let me use that. And all the time say, only the rule of the people and not forget their respective religions. Now, citizenship, what does it mean in Europe? Can I be a Muslim or a Jew? In a Lutheran country, in, a, in Germany, in England, in, in, uh, in, in Spain. And that is the challenge. Because if they don't discuss citizenship at the moment in Europe, then I am afraid you are creating ghettos. And it has to be you know, addressed at, with respect to the Sharia, to the Halakha. And what can we do? Because if you don't discuss it in Europe, it will reflect on us. We are living, you know, a millet society, a communities that are following Christians in a Muslim state or in a Jewish state, our own family laws. Why it can it be in Europe? Of course, this is the discussion. This is what the Archbishop was raising. If it doesn't succeed in Europe, if it succeeds in the Middle East, why it can't it succeed in the democratic Europe? And democracy does not mean the vote of the majority. Democracy means nowadays uh, uh, respecting the minority that cannot have a majority vote. 
And for me, that is the challenge which we have to find in Muslim, Christian, Jewish dialogue nowadays in Europe. In the United States of America, I believe, and with all respect, the challenge which we face is extremism from the Christian right or from some Jewish community or from some Muslim communities. And that should be discussed on the table, not secretly. And the feeling against each other that these are bringing, you see, and promoting, it should be discussed. So for this reason, with all humility, I say, it should be contextual. Maybe you have other things on the agenda which I don't know. But what I feel, you know, traveling to the States or traveling to Europe, that these are the things that should be discussed at the moment. I can add something to this I, uh, and to, st to stand with Ben here, and, and that is that um, uh, I, I, I think that it, I really agree with you, Bishop, when you say that, uh, that there are national particularities. There, there are, this conversation about dialogue is going to take a particular form in, and face particular challenges in different contexts. And I do, think, I do think that in the United States, part of what is going to have to be faced is not simply, as Ben has, you know, I think that what will have to be faced is not simply the dangers of the religious right, but uh, as Ben is, is alerting us to, also the, the sort of hidden pieties of the religious left. Uh, and that's part of it, too. Um, it's, it's not simply, I don't think we can sit here and simply point fingers comfortably at the religious right without attending very seriously to uh, what Ben says. It is the responsibility of intellectuals to always trouble waters that are otherwise becoming too inspiring. Uh, and that, uh, that is what we do. One more question, Hans Peter. Yeah, I would like to um, oppose a bit um, your last uh, statement, my dear uh, Bishop Yunan because you talked about Europe and I'm a contextual European, so I'm, I felt a bit um, um, yeah, forced to say something. Because I think the situation you described first in um, the Near East, um, it's actually looking on the political situation, not a good situation. So you're forced by a bad situation to do the dialogue with others, to build up trust, avoid misunderstandings and all those groups, the religious groups, have to be involved in a process to improve the political situation. In Europe, if you now make the analogy and say in Europe you have to fi find a similar way uh, coming to civil society, um, so you're transferring from a problematic situation something in a, I would say, fairly better political situation, something which is not right because in the European context, it is essential that in the public sphere every individual has same rights. And it would be a fault in Europe to divide in a similar sense the society into such groups, identities, religious identities, uh, social identities, and you would um, come to a method of dealing out um, political uh, decisions by um, meetings of such representatives of such groups. We have public, a public discussion and everybody can share in if he wants to. So it would be a, a really uh, stepping back behind something which was um, a progress in the last 200 years in Europe if one would come from this bad political situation and transfer it to... Um, that would not be um, uh, my thing and I think um, it comes a bit to, I would say, another problem, and I would like to uh, come to the other speakers as well, especially to the topic of law. Um, and it, it was this, the, the, the example of Indonesia, because I know uh, people, and I was together with them uh, some weeks ago, that uh, there's a strong movement in Indonesia to um, bring in... Um, I would say, Islam-inspired law into the general law of Indonesia. And the Christian churches are uh, forced by them or are threatened by that because they feel that certain rights um, they have now, they can't um, live according to that uh, in the future because 
there is a coming some law which is inspired by a religious group or by a religious identity which claims general acknowledgement. And I would like to see that religions not only have this dialogue, but they stepping back for, I would say, the common good and accepting, for example, some kind of secular law rather than implementing their religious inspired law for the good of living together despite different religious identities and so on. Thank you. Yes, I don't want to, uh, I think, you know, oppose you and I don't, I don't hint at all to go back 200 years, I mean, with my remarks, not at all. But, you know, let me speak from the point of view of the immigrants in Europe. When I come to Europe, I have contact with them and I hear what they grumble. At the same time, you know, take Denmark what happened last week, or France. Or if we take, for example, those who committed the horrendous acts in London, they were Muslims who, grew, who were born in Britain. They were not Muslims who came from Pakistan. I think Europe has to stand a moment of truth and ask how can we accommodate the, the immigrants from other religions within our society, integrate them and allow them to integrate and not allow them to feel always that they are strangers yearning to go back to their country. And that's what I wanted to say, to, uh, to say, w w to, to say, because if we don't dialogue with the Muslim and Jewish community and other communities that are in Europe at the moment and leave it as such, I'm afraid we are only uh, postponing the problem or we are having a, a ticking bomb that one day will explode and it will not be good for Europe. For this reason, let us have on the table what does citizenship mean and what does it include and how can a Jew and how can a Muslim live as a Muslim and a Jew with full rights and full responsibility in Europe not how the European, original European feel, but how the Muslim and Jew, the new Muslim and the new Jewish immigrant fe uh, European feel in Europe. That's what I'm trying to say. We may disagree and discuss it more, Hans Peter. <laughs> I will note that we are closing that Hans Peter, you, uh, you talked about progress over the last 200 years, which gets us right back to the time of the French Revolution. Um, the conference, of course, has looked beyond the French, before the French Revolution, to Luther. Uh, Europe has multiple inheritances, and I guess that at root, part of what we've been talking about, or what you've all been talking about over the last two days, is how these various inheritances can uh, uh, aid in the modern world to get us out of the dilemmas that many of us feel are most urgent and most pressing. Thanks to the panel very much for their uh, uh, wise comments, to Bishop Yunan for his inspiring address. As I tell my students, the uh, uh, proof of the existence of God is the existence of is that God gave us wine. And so there's wine outside for all of you to enjoy now. Please stay for some time. <laughs>